So I'm Helen Filon, um, one of the founders of the Deccan Heritage Foundation, and we're very happy to, um, to welcome you all to the last of this fifth webinar series that we have organized with um, the Cambridge, uh, the, the Cambridge University, the, uh, the Altani, um, the Islamic Center at, at Cambridge University, the Museum of Art and Photography, and the Bangalore International Center. Um, this has been a wonderful uh, new series, a series of wonderful new lectures and themes that have really made this series worthy and very interesting for us all, whether whether uh, whether we are um, well 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 versed in this area or not. Uh, I'm also very happy to welcome today to our last webinar a brilliant young scholar, um, Sylvia Hotling, who's an assistant professor in the Department of History of Art at Bryn Mawr University College, where she she received her AB from Harvard University and an MPhil in history at the University of Cambridge, where she was the Lionel de Jersey Harvard um, student. After completing her PhD from Yale University in 2015, she did her postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of Islamic Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Her publications include articles in Ars Orientalis, the Textile Museum, Journal of Religions, and essays for the exhibition catalog of cloth that changed the world. And, um, uh, the, it, was, uh, it was at the Royal Ontario Museum in 2020. And Indian textiles, 1000 years of art uh, at, on the cloth in Mughal India, uh, published by, I oh, know that is the book that I'm going to talk about to you afterwards, not now when, when the lecture has finished. Um, so the lecture, uh, as you know, the title is Kalamkari Textiles of Golconda, Searching for Stories of Production, Patronage and Place. So, um, so please, we welcome, um, we welcome Sylvia. Thank you um, for what I'm sure is going to be a most exciting um, lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fizan, for that really kind introduction. And thank you to uh, Dr. Vivek Gupta. Uh, Neil Cunningham and Shrikara Datatraya for including me in this wonderful webinar series that I've appreciated so much over the past um, the past years. Um, and I offer my appreciation also to the Deccan Heritage Foundation, the Center of Islamic Studies at the University of Cambridge, the Bangalore International Center, and the Museum of Art and Photography, which is opening next week. Um, I see many familiar names in this webinar, some faces many to whom I owe debts of huge gratitude, and I thank you all for being here um, today. So by the year of 1700, the Kalamkari textiles from Muchley Putnam, the central port of the Sultanate of Golconda, had gained renown from Delhi to London. The British Daniel Defoe, author of Robinson Crusoe, wrote of how following the 1689 Glorious Revolution, Queen Mary and William of Orange had brought to Britain the love of fine East Indian calicos, such as were then called Maslapatam chintz. The French physician and traveler, Francois Bernier, while traveling with the imperial entourage on a slow paced overland journey from Delhi to Lahore and onward to Kashmir, marveled at Emperor Alamgir's largest tent where he engaged in business while in military tour, as well as his five other main tents, that were lined with, quote, beautiful hand-painted sheets manufactured for the purpose at Musley Putnam. Bernier wrote repeatedly that the painted cloths he saw came from Musley Putnam, a site known also as Masuli Putnam and Muchley Putnam, or simply as Bandar, port, that he correctly locates elsewhere in the text as a thriving 17th century port located in the Deccan Sultanate of Golconda. He attributes the textile's fineness not only to the naturalism of the floral patterns, but also to the waters around Muchley Putnam. The superior colors of the Muchley Putnam chintz or cloths painted by hand, whose freshness seems to improve by washing, are ascribed to the water peculiar to that town. Daniel Defoe and Francois Bernier's descriptions present a European perspective on the origins of cloth, of which historians should rightly be wary, 
Consumers from abroad often misidentified textiles with a port of origin, such as the cloth given the name of Calico after the port of Calicut, which we now know was not made where the cloth was actually made. Was this another instance of Muchley Putnam standing in for the whole of southeastern India in a far off imaginary? Now, within the Hadikat of Salatin, the chronicle history describing Hyderabad written by Nizamuddin Ahmed, a Persian resident in Golconda in the early 1640s, we have an earlier account told from a more local perspective that confirms that the Mughal emperors in fact favored the cloths of the Deccan and particularly Muchli Putnam's painted cotton textiles. Other parts of, this, of the Hadikat have been analyzed in the work of Simon Digby, Karen Ruffle, and Marika Sardar. But in a different section, the Hadika tells how every year the then reigning emperor Shah Jahan sent a trusted person to Muchli Putnam to handle the purchase of these same painted cotton cloths that Bernier describes, but which are called with the word that we now use, Kalamkari. The text recounts an event in the late uh, 1640s or early uh, in late 1640 or early 1641 when Shah Jahan had deputized Mirza Sadek Khaswini, who went by the nickname Chishro to arrange his Kalamkari cloths. Shah Jahan's deputy first visited the Sultan of Golconda in Hyderabad, who held jurisdiction over the port of Muchli Putnam over 200 miles to the east. He brought with him an official letter filled with kindnesses from the emperor and a ring with rubies that Shah Jahan had taken from his own hand. Because of this valuable gift, Shah Jahan's deputy gained much attention at court. The account then says that Mirza Sadek Khasvini was supposed to commission the Kalamkari cloths, Kalamkari Parche, in the same manner as the previous year's officials, and to use the workers of Machali Putnam to make it. Mirza Sadek Khasvini himself then traveled from Golconda to Machali Putnam to make sure that this was done. This account suggests a high degree of specificity about the patronage of painted cotton cloths or Kalamkari in 17th century Hindustan. First, the emperor had intentionally deputized an imperial official to carry out the commission. He specifically had his deputy deliver a letter and a gift to the rulers of Golconda, and he desired continuity with the previous year's product. It also affirms the importance of his deputy traveling to the site of production. Mirza Sadek Khasvini was directed to actually visit Machli Putnam in order to hire workers from the surrounding area. The way that this is described as an annual task suggests a consistent renewal of cloths from Machli Putnam for the Mughal emperor. And to my knowledge, this is the first evidence for direct Mughal patronage of Kalamkari cloth from the Deccan and is among the earliest documented uses of the Persian term for, kalam, for cotton cloths painted with mordants and dyes. My talk today focuses on the Kalamkari textiles of the Deccan, and it details the search for archives of patronage, for paths of circulation, and for evidence of artisan lives and modes of production. I want to evoke how the fame of cloth from Machu Putnam in the Sultanate of Golconda was about more than a name, that it was about a place, even if, as I'll discuss at the end, this place and its artists shifted around. And I wish to ask whether textiles like these but also textiles like these um, painted, dyed, and washed perhaps in coastal Golconda, or these, which are among the most stylistically diverse textiles ever made, directed as they were to all parts of the globe, can nonetheless be conceptualized as one of the most abundant forms of Dakini art remaining. I'll first present documented examples of the designation of Machli Putnam for the valued painted cotton textiles, not just references from British and European merchant documents and shipping lists, which are manifold, but also more local regional accounts from Mughal news reports of Golconda, the inventory accounts of the Rajput court of Amer, and the popular poetry of Rajasthan, to suggest that the renown of Golconda's port of Machli Putnam reached both closer to home and far away. Second, I'll consider the artistic, ecological, and material uniqueness of the textiles from the surroundings of Machli Putnam that affirm the significance of this place and its textile makers. And then last, I'll consider the art historical challenge of a textual archive and material archive that it hasn't yet been possible to reunite. For despite the recurrence in local and global archives of the cotton cloths from Machli Putnam, none of the many extant export textiles from this early modern period can be securely attributed to this site of production. Moreover, because the patrons for Kalamkari textiles included a wide range of individuals, from South Asian and British royalty to Japanese merchants and European householders, 
The styles of the cloths are dizzyingly diverse, displaying for floral, figurative, and geometric ornament that makes it difficult to identify a characteristic stylistic repertoire that would usually be the key to establishing place of production. Instead, I'm offering an account, perhaps speculative, that focuses on the cloth's material qualities and the clues they reveal from the processes of production, arguing that in their interlinked materiality and visual content, these cloths tell us about the nature of the soil and water, the paths of makers, and the practices of the workshops that made them. This is an important part of reconstituting histories of early modern objects that eventually became part of broader networks of exchange. For the mismatch we have here of textual archive and material archive is not unique to the early modern coastal Deccan. The fame of a placing contrasted with the anonymity of its most famous textile products gives a unique kind of historical ghostliness to Muchley Putnam that comes from being a site whose renown largely came from the act of dispersing its most precious crafts in the regional and global export trade. First, I'll start with this designated, documented designation of Muchley Putnam as the origin of fine cloths that obscures the fact that the textiles were made not in the port itself, seen here, but in regional villages located along the Krishna and Godavari rivers that lay within a radius of about 50 miles of Muchley Putnam, including, but not limited to, Patabali, also known as Nizam Putnam, and Paliko, seen here. Muchley Putnam, uh, and here are this, the, 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 some of the, the most mentioned um, famed sites uh, of, of the cloth production. Muchley Putnam itself, the city of Fish, um, or Muchley, was a site with a deep navigable port and a diverse and mercantile population in the 17th century that's been estimated at 100,000 to 200,000 people, so sizable, a sizable city. It served as the gathering place for textiles and the emporium to purchase cloths destined for the Indonesian archipelago and Thailand, Japan and China, coastal East Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, Ottoman and Safavid lands, and onward to Europe. The surroundings of Muchley Putnam were far from the only sites that produced high quality painted cotton textiles, a craft whose reach extended to Gujarat and far south along the Eastern coast. Yet the repeated mention of this site in regional documents suggests that something about Muchley Putnam had a precise significance and cultural cachet in the wider landscape of South Asian textiles, a significance that has typically been overshadowed in the historiography by the global reach of Muchley Putnam cloth. This cloth for which Muchley Putnam and its surroundings became famous were cotton fabrics that had been painted with a sharpened bamboo pen used in mordants and wax resists and then dyed a brilliant range of colors. These cloths were known by many names throughout South Asia. In the early records from Rajasthan I have consulted, they were known as chint, the Hindi word referencing the colorful nature of the cloth that comes from the verb chitna, to spray or sprinkle. This entered English as the word chintz and Persian as chit. The French Francois Bernier refers to the textiles as chit, which he defines as cloths painted by hand and also as andienne the French word that could encompass both painted and block printed textiles. The, the term kalamkarik parcha, which surfaced in Nizamuddin Ahmed's account, so combines the word for the reed used as a pen, kalam, and kari, a, a Persian suffix which means generally work. The name for these pen worked textiles emphasizes the freehand nature of the production with a pen, as distinguished from block printed textiles whose patterns derive from the repeated stamping of a printer's block. Although in the subsequent centuries, both painted and printed textiles have come to be known as kalamkari. In the hand-painted kalamkari, the artist draws the outlines of the designs with charcoal. Then, as we can see in these amazing works of the contemporary artist Lavanya Mani, designs emerge from the fine lines of metallic mordants. And here we see on the right that she's used iron, alum, and tin mordants. These liquid mordants, the word from Latin mordere, are metallic oxides that bite literally into the cloth to prepare it for the dye colors in which they will then be submerged. This distinguishes cloth painting from other kinds of painting where pigments are applied directly to the canvas or wall. The textile historian John Irwin, who first argued for a corpus of what he called Golconda cotton paintings, 
wrote in 1959 uh, in the journal Lalit Kala that we find in 17th century Kalamkari textiles, this painting technique, quote, carried to its furthest point, whereby the final effect obtained is so like freehand wall painting as to make it easy to forget that we are not actually looking at painting at all, but really a complicated exercise in the chemistry of dye fixing. By the start of the 17th century, the British and Dutch and French East India companies had set up factories in Muchley Putnam, from which they both sought to transport painted cotton textiles initially to Southeast Asia, but increasingly after the 1660s to export cotton textiles to Britain and Europe. Agents for the Mughal emperors, such as Mirza Sadiq Kasvini, ordered cloths alongside French, English, Dutch, Portuguese, Persian, Armenian, Arab, and scores of local and regional merchants who carried out the business of trade in the spice-rich islands of Southeast Asia and for, with the consumers of the Persian Gulf. From the king of Thailand sent his own merchants to the Coromandel coast to directly deliver his specifically royal designs, as did the king of Bantam. As the work of Sanjay Subramaniam and others has reminded us, for most of the 17th century, European powers were far from controlling the trade in Muchley Putnam. In uh, 1646, for instance, the English East India Company officials complained that the king of Golconda, whose country it is, took so great of an affection unto fine cotton paintings that he commanded that the painters should only work for them. As late as 1675, when the English heard that the Sultan was coming to visit Muchley Putnam, they hid their export textiles in a hole dug in the courtyard of their factory, seen here, to prevent him from seizing them. While such a seizure of goods never seems to have transpired, the likelihood was that the finest Kalimkari cloths in the 17th century were commissioned and retained by merchants and agents working for South Asian courts. The Wakai, or news reports, sent from the Deccan to the Mughal emperor to track the happenings throughout the empire, confirmed that the Sultan of Golconda used Kalamkari as a valued material for courtly gifts. In August, 1661, Sultan Abdullah Qutb Shah sent 25 rolls of Kalamkari cloth, written here again as uh, Parcha Kalamkari, and, uh, and a letter to Sayyid Ilyas, a servant of the Bijapur ruler, Ali al-Dil Shah II. On the same day, he also sent two trays of fruit to the vakil of the Shah of Iran. Sultan Abdullah Qutb Shah also received gifts of Kalamkari cloth from Suri Rao, the governor of Machali Putnam. In May 1662, Suri Rao sent the Sultan a Kalamkari canopy and its cloth screens, or kanat, as well as a small tent, all from Machali Putnam. Less auspicious events give a sense for how the valuable Machali Putnam cloth moved through space such as a robbery. One Isar Das, who was a merchant of Burhanpur, was transporting cloth from Machli Putnam to Udgir. On his way through Hyderabad, thieves murdered one member of his party and carried off two bales of cloth. The fact that a high-ranking official of Golconda then promised restitution for the stolen bales of cloth, and that the Mukha reports noted this, suggests the value that Machli Putnam cloth held along the trade routes of the Deccan. Indeed, in the reports, besides Machali Putnam cloth, only Gujarati cloth is mentioned by place name. All other robes and textiles are left generic. We also have both textual and tentative material evidence that objects from Machali Putnam would have traveled northwest to Rajasthan. The court of Amr in Rajasthan, now present-day Jaipur, retained the best documented corpus of 17th century South Asian textiles through the 20th century a collection that includes a large number of painted cotton Kalamkari textiles. Scholars including Chantramani Singh, Ellen Smart, Stephen Cohn, uh, Rosemary Krill, Rahul Jain, and Shalka Mishra have determined that many of the finest extant Kalamkari textiles from the 17th century bear the distinctive inventory markings of the Amer court, markings that note the size, price, and the date of the inventory taken. On the painted cotton textiles, the dates reach back to the 1630s, Yet the Amr textiles do not list their places of origin. On the reverse, unlike some of the car collection's carpets, which bear labels that even name the merchants in Lahore from whom they were purchased. While I will elaborate on this question more at the end of the talk, the style of these rare Kalamkari objects with figural scenes from Amr has long been associated with the Persianate visual and uh, cultural courtly style shared by the Islamic Deccan including the Northern Coromandel Coast and the Sultanate of Golconda. On these small painted cotton cloths, four of which 
were confirmed by inventory markings to have been collected by the Amir court. The figures were the large turbans and central fastening garments of contemporary Safavid Iran, seen also in figures in Deccani paintings. Many of the attendant figures, the women in particular, don South Asian trolley blouses and jewelry and wear pleated patka sashes tied at around their waists, which also appear in paintings made in the 17th century Deccan. In my own research into the written inventories of the Toshkana, or textile records from Amer, now held in the Rajasthan State Archives, I found evidence that the Amer court had indeed imported textiles from Achille Putnam, corroborating what scholars had posited from the visual features of the objects. On certain pages of the textile inventories, the cloths are appended with adjectives identifying places from which they arrived, Sanganeri cloth, for the textile vi uh, producing village of Sanganer just beyond uh, Amer, cloth from Agra, cloth costly Multani textiles. The textiles in these records are not called Kalamkari, but rather Chint. The Machipatam cloth in the uh, Amer inventory was valued at the extraordinarily high price we see here of 32 rupees per piece. It was only rivaled in price by a printed cloth from Multan and an extremely fine cotton muslin from Bengal. Bringing this archival evidence together with the extant textiles, we can also make guesses about the nature of the cloths from Machili Putnam that surface in the text of the inventories. This large scale summer carpet made from what might be Machili Putnam uh, Kalamkari and measuring five yards on each side was inventoried at a price of 30 rupees in 1690, suggesting that perhaps the one in the inventory was also very large in size. References to Machili Putnam cloth also appear in poetic couplets describing cloth circulating in Rajasthan. One of these poems, the Kapada Kutuhal, or Clothing Curiosities, first uncovered and published by Chandramani Singh in the Jaipur City Palace uh, Libraries, was composed by a poet named Prayagdas in the mid to late 17th century in Mewar. The poem contextualizes fabrics into different snippets of narrative and vivid visual scenes. One couplet from the poem includes a textile imported from Machli Putnam, given as a gift to a lady from her lover. Singh translates this, pleased with her Kanshuki blouse of the charming Machi Patan, just presented by her lover, the lovely lady is fanning on her darling who is reclining in bed. In the couplet, the blouse from far away Machi Patan has captured the lady's heart and mind, Man Bhavto, and earned her affection. These poetic couplets familiarized readers in Rajasthan with the textiles of faraway Machli Putnam. Cloth was lodged in the mind when imagined wrapped around the body of a beloved. As we have seen in the Amir court, Machli Putnam cloth was given a high monetary value in inventories. It earned a lover's appreciation in popular poetry. And we know from textual sources that it was specifically commissioned by the Mughal emperor on a yearly basis. In the period from approximately 1630 to 1690, the textile trade in the vicinity of Machli Putnam expanded considerably, and a wide array of patrons sought out the Machli Putnam cloth. And yet we will likely never know with certainty exactly which extant textiles, if any, are these famed Machli Putnam Kalamkari. What we do know is that Machli Putnam cloth was likely made in the direct vicinity of the Machli Putnam port, rather than just arbitrarily bearing its name. While many other craft processes could be relocated to the Karkhanas, or as documents suggests, to the royal workshops in the capital of Hyderabad, the intricacies of Machli Putnam uh, Kalamkari manufacture required patrons to travel to the site to acquire the cloth, as we saw in the example of the Mughal um, uh, 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 agent. Although the Mughal imperial court is said to have tried to bring Machli Putnam cloth painters to set up a workshop in Delhi or Agra, their efforts were unsuccessful. The intricacies of Kalamkari's manufacture worked to humble its patrons. In part, artisans could not or would not relocate because the material history of painted cotton textiles has a decidedly ecological dimension. Indeed, to make a single painted cotton cloth like this one in the National Museum in New Delhi, uh, freed from its, from its frame, we can kind of sense its texture. You had to use raw cotton, much of it grown in the rich volcanic soils in the center of the Deccan that was transported to the Eastern coast in bales by bullock tended by the Banjara communities across the craggy landscape. The caravans that carried the cotton returned with salt from the coast. 
The cotton moved into the homes of spinners and weavers where it was spun and then woven in family homes to a standardized width. After bleaching in citrus and animal dung, the gold standard of bleaching techniques then and now, the cotton yardage was distributed along with the patron's patterns to painters who worked in the Kalamkari technique. The cloth was first soaked in a grainy yellow mixture made from ground myroblin fruit and buffalo milk, which gave it a soft, dusty texture. The fat in the buffalo milk helped to prevent the outlines from spreading, while the other components in the buffalo milk, sugars and calcium, was said to have brightened the dye colors, although even today the precise chemistry behind this effect is not known. After the buffalo milk and myroblin dried, the tannins in the myroblin fruit worked as a ground for the application of the iron mordant, described earlier, that reacted with the tannins to create the black outlines of the cloth. And here in these images, I, I should note that I'm using photographs from Sri Kalahasti, which is further inland and south of Machiliputnam, where hand-painted Kalamkari textiles are now made, whereas Machiliputnam uh, now has primarily block printing workshops. As the painters worked, they squeezed the liquid out of an egg-shaped reservoir filled with wool, cotton, or jute to absorb the liquid and wrapped with thread. And again, another note, just that these are present day photographs which aren't meant to stand in um, and can't fully capture the historical processes, but that do give us a sense of texture and uh, saturation of color, um, even if the materials um, and art artistic practices um, are quite different. The areas that were designated as red, pink, or purple would be filled in with a colorless alum mordant, um, like we saw earlier, and then boiled in a red dye bath. Turmeric served as a yellow dye and would be applied directly to the cloth or could be combined with indigo to produce green. Pomegranate rinds produced a deep mustard colored dye, but could also create pastai or pistachio colored greens and also certain pink colors. Fine white lines, painted with wax or mud, protected parts of the cloth that would remain the original white color when the textile was then dyed. Before submersion in an indigo dye bath, any parts of the design that were not intended to be blue had to be covered with wax to protect the colors from the indigo. The last dyed added were the yellow dyes because they were more fugitive. When the dye baths were complete, the cloth was bleached again and laid out to dry, a process that did not dull the red as a modern chlorine based bleach would, but rather enhanced its brightness. It was then starched with rice starch, beetled or beaten, and polished to give it a glazed finish. While the paintings on Kalamkari cloth draw the eye, it was the quickly finished part of the process, in contrast to the slow, accretive process of adding dyes and wax interspersed with periods of boiling and drying in the sun. This hanging, fashioned as a kanat for a tent, features a ganda barunda, a fearsome two-headed bird from Hindu mythology that holds two elephants in its beak. The painter's work here is virtuosic. The beady eyes and scaly skins of the Bharunda are echoed in the toothy texture of the long, thin leaves above. The rendering of the figures is especially impressive given that the paint was a liquid iron or alum mordant dispensed from the end of a wooden stick. The difficulty lay in keeping the liquid mordant moving along the cloth in an even line without letting it pool. The painter has also used resist work that has been applied as wax. The areas that have been kept white, such as the paired birds, red spotted feathers, were created by applying wax with a metal tipped pen before mordanting and submersion in the red dye bath. The painter's visual vocabulary is wide ranging, encompassing new world pineapples and flaming medallions. But the most persistent, pulsating red colors of the cloth are from the chaya ver or chai root, Oldenladia umbalata, a unique dye stuff to Southern Asia. Everything dyed with the red chai root appears to spring forward. The flaming vines and arched top wings of the barunda, the rich lotus flowers and the chevrons of white and red pattern on the cloth's internal border. The root of the chai plant is, uh, is used in a similar manner to the ubiquitous red colorant, the matter root, a dye plant known worldwide by the 17th century. Yet the chai root's tenor is richer and more concentrated. Matter dye contains three primary chemical compounds, alizarin, pseudopurpurin, and purpurin, which when combined with a mordant yield red, rose, and purple colors. The thin roots of the chai root, however, carry only alizarin. 
the result is a concentrated, unadulterated crimson hue. And in fact, when chemists set out to produce synthetic red dyes in the 19th century, they ended up synthesizing the same pure alizarin from coal tar byproducts. The quality of the che root itself also mattered. Che root grew in Orissa and Bengal and in the vicinity of Madurai. And as Mark Baumfort's ongoing research suggests, the Dutch VOC enslaved Tamil workers in the 17th century to grow che root in, the, in northern Sri Lanka. The northern Coromandel coast, however, produced the most treasured che root, which grew best in the wild in the sandy soil of the local river beds of the Krishna and Godavari deltas, these areas that were rich in calcium from decomposing seashells. Although the sea does not feel so close when you visit Machli Patna now, it is helpful to remember that all of these textile sites are right by the ocean. Even today, Chai Root's cousin, the common matter root, is known to produce better dyes in soil high in calcium, like you would find by the ocean with decomposing seashells. The governor of Machli Putnam held an exclusive lease on land across the river from the town of Padapoli, where wild Chai Root grew seen right along here. The Dutch report suggests that the governor kept the che root for his own purposes, to dye the uniforms of his soldiers, and also sent it to the Safavid ruler. The southern Coromandel coast was said to grow an inferior form of che root, and dyers working near the port of Madras imported che root from the northern Coromandel coast for dyeing. In 1605, the Dutch set up a resident in Patapali, also known as I said before as Nizan Putnam, specifically because they knew that the cloths dyed with this particular red color were desired in Indonesian textile markets. Interestingly, despite its superior dye qualities, che root um, was never cultivated in Europe because dyers could not coax the dye from it. And it was not imported because as scholar Bessie Cecil has noted, the roots lose vitality if they are held in a darkened hold of a ship for too long. Yet historical documents suggest that chai root was traded from the region around Muchli Putnam to other sites in South Asia, suggesting the high value of the dye material. In a collaborative dye analysis project I conducted with Dr. Nobuko Shibayama, a biochemist in the Department of Scientific Research at the Met, we found that chai root had been used to dye the brilliant red poppy flowers on a set of cotton textiles that were likely once part of a large hanging or floor covering. The arrangement of the lush, vibrant poppy pattern in regularized, individualized units locates the site of production as Burhanpur, or likely site of production, um, the Mughal city in the northern Deccan, as shown in Vivek Gupta's wonderful work on the city and its connection to this textile and poppy production. The chai root used to dye this cloth, however, may have been imported into Burhanpur from outside of Machli Putnam, a distance 500 miles away. The textile raises other interesting questions. While its patterns and paintings derive from Borhanpur, is its color the product of the sandy soil of Machli Putnam, where its singular red dye root grew? Is this another meaning for Machli Putnam cloths that they're made with this dye root that has traveled? The washing and boiling processes for dyeing were also extremely sensitive to the quality of water. The regions around Muchley Putnam boasted unique water conditions that improved dye colors. And here I want to direct your work, uh, you to the, the excellent work of Rajarshi Sangupta, who spoke in this venue um, last spring, um, who has combined fantastic historical study with contemporary fieldwork to show how it was and continues to be the mixing of the salty waters and the sweet waters in the estuarial sites that affected the dye colors achieved, since the salt helps in binding the colors to cotton fibers. In the nearby village of Gondavaram, which was located near a water source that was said to have the desired high alkalinity, four-fifths of the households worked as cloth washers due to the value of this particular site's water. European narrative accounts collected in the East India Company record books chart the movements of artisans to these sites of cloth production. At times, an artisan's surname will indicate his village of origin, linking a washer or painter with an inland site that he vacated for better opportunities elsewhere. A 1692 Dutch census of Gondavaram lists washers with the names of inland villages miles away, Alur and Kudulu, who must have traveled to this site to work washing clothes in this very specific water. The special alchemy of water composition and dye materials was not translatable across space and never has been. We marvel at the distances that these cloths traveled along maritime trade routes, forgetting that 17th century cloths could move much further than their makers because textile painters, washers, and dyers and their material conditions were more fixedly tied in place. 
And yet throughout the 17th century, in periods of war and famine, textile makers were impelled to move to escape hardship or gain employment. By historical accident, one such mobile maker, a master painter of textiles, appears in British records from the 1650s from Madras or Chennai, which is located much further south than Muchley Putnam in the 1650s. This master painter had been ejected from the workshop by his fellow painters, who had then changed their minds and protested to get him back. In the process, the painter, called Kalahasti, reveals his place of origin in Sri Kalahasti, an inland te temple town 75 miles away from Madras that is one of the unique remaining centers of hand-painted contemporary Kalamkari production. Kalahasti must have come to Madras for a work opportunity, leaving behind his hometown, but bringing his name with him. This incident, like the names of washers in Gunavaram, suggests that the painting sites surrounding Muchley Putnam were likely also to have been populated by local makers and talented textile artists who had traveled from various other sites to work there. And I should say here that we um, sort of tantalizingly get a sense of the names um, of the places from which these, um, these artists came, but we only sharpen to the sort of level of place, um, not their, their identities, um, their, their so social or um, religious affiliations. Um, we have just a sense of movement through space. While artists brought with them skills and tastes, they also transferred visual content that had been painted into, onto immobile architecture. One of the closest visual parallels for extant figural Kalamkari textiles in southern India uh, in southern, is southern Indian temple wall painting. Um, so the closest parallels for the textiles is the wall painting itself, a topic explored in the work of Anna Seastrand, Brigitte Khan Madlis, Majlis, and Anna Della Piccola. The 17th century or the 16th century temple complex in the Pakshi con contains well-preserved figural paintings on the ceiling of the temple Mandapa that have frequently been connected to Kalamkari cloth. There's been really excellent work um, uh, done on this, this connection. In this site, women in patterned lower garments sway, their hands extended in front of them. On the beams between the plastered ceiling panels, the artists have painted non-figural patterns taken from the textiles from southeastern India, a checkered blue and white pattern on a lowered beam, or a floral arabesque that separates the tiers of figural imagery. The edges of the ceiling painting are, giving a wave, are given a waving line and a border, suggestive of a lightweight cloth stretching and fluttering against its nail supports. In this way, the paintings do not merely suggest cloth patterns, but rather embody them for their viewer alerting us to the uses of the more fragile cloths with narrative scenes that may have once been tacked to the ceiling. Whether le the Lepakshi scenes are directly related to any Kalampati textiles, the prevalence of textile patterning at this temple suggests that the painters who created these murals had an awareness of, if not an expertise, in painting cloth. Given that artisans traveled, as the story of the Madras chief painter from the temple town of Kalahasti, Kalahasti shows, they may have brought with them their visual memory of painted walls and ceilings. Other artists likely came from further away. In the 1630s, the Western Deccan and Gujarat were beset by drought and then floods that ruined the harvest and led to widespread famine, a catastrophe with particularly tragic consequences for artisans in the textile trade, who typically did not till their own fields and latch surplus food. Records from the period recounted that weavers, washers, and dyers who had not perished were, quote, dispersed into foreign parts of greater plenty, including possibly areas around Muchley Putnam. As with the Coromandel Coast, Gujarat has been renowned for its brightly colored cotton textiles that were both painted and printed with floral, geometric, and figural designs. Gujarati textiles are quite different in appearance from the Deccani cotton paintings. Though they twist and bend with dynamism, the large female figures on some of the best preserved Gujarati textiles, which are um, uh, found in, uh, largely in Indonesia, are more stylized and closely resemble Jain manuscript painting from the same period. And their color palette is more limited to a rich, nearly black dyed hue of blue, red, and white. The Coromandel Coast cotton paintings have curving naturalistic swaths of flowers and vines as patterning, while the Gujarati patterning features a range of squares, dots, and diamonds that even if they were painted with a Kalam pen, more closely resemble the geometric shapes found on a block printed textile. However, more subtle details do propose, I think speculatively, a few ways in which Gujarati techniques may have entered into the Kalamkari production um, if and when the artists from Gujarat moved in the 1630s. 
One of the most distinctive features of the Gujarati painted cotton textiles is their use of a resist, the wax or mud substance that protect the white cloth from absorbing the dye color, resulting in fine white lines and patterns that make a striking contrast against the concentrated blue and red colors of the textiles, as we see here. In the hand-painted cotton cloths from Gujarat, the artists have filled in the space inside these white resist lines here with a darker, sometimes deep blue or almost black color. This technique of surrounding a dark color with a light resist was also adopted within the large scale, scale Coromandel Coast textiles, where it was similarly used in the background of figural scenes, seen here, these white um, resists filled in with a dark color. The combination of white outline and the intense color of the filling makes the dark shapes appear jewel-like as they seem to float in the lightened space of the resist lines. Although this effect is mainly used in the background patterning, it creates a sense of depth and movement. As such, these are cloths that might be able to tell us in many ways about their place of making, perhaps not through their overt stylistic cues, the typical root of art historians, but with more subtlety about the nature of the soil and water and the paths of painters, washers, and dyers who made them. When looked at up close, the textiles reveal the immediate environment that has been absorbed into the fibers of the cotton, as the colors of the dyes shifted with variations in water quality. And in the semi-arid climate of Rajasthan, where we know so many of these brightly colored Kalamkari textiles were collected, it was maybe the fact that they were suffused with such verdant colors that made these garden carpets used during the summer so appealing bringing in their materiality, a fresh sea breeze from Achille Putnam all the way to Amir. And yet it is still not a stable mode of location or identification to look at a cloth's materiality. In the 1690s, after the Mughal siege of Golconda in 1687, British officials in Madras sensed an opportunity to bring superior painters from the areas around Machli Putnam to the south. Quote, knowing that Masali Putnam has become almost desolate, they wrote, not one house of almost a hundred inhabited, we hope some of those fine painters that used to live there will come to inhabit in Madras. They wrote again, urging their Madras counterpart counterparts to contrive to find out the place of the Machali Putnam painter's present residence and invite them to inhabit our society of Madras, giving for their encouragement assurances of a constant employment. These invitations were repeated again and again, even though the chai root was inferior and the waters by Fort St. George and Madras were less favorable for the dying processes. By 1696, the London directors had become impatient. We have writ so much formerly concerning your procuring of fine painters to inhabit Fort St. George that we can add little, but to desire you give no rest to your thoughts and endeavors until you have obtained some number of those artificers that can work to the perfection of a pattern. Whether the East India Company was successful in attracting these fine painters from Machli Putnam is unknown. What this suggests, however, is that the warfare and constant upheaval of the late 17th century caused movement among the great artificers of Machli Putnam, spurring the flow of visual styles and material expertise throughout the Coromandel Coast, contributing to this sense that makes Machli Putnam's cloth so difficult to trace. To counteract these layers of uncertainty about the cloths, it is tempting to search for this unique place depicted or represented in the people and plants of its textiles. And at times these efforts do bear fruit. On the cloths interspersed among the flora and foods of the globe, Chinese peonies and chrysanthemums, pineapples and English strawberries, I did eventually realize that I had glimpsed a specific, more local flower represented. What I had taken for granted over here um, as a decorative flourish, a white wax resist patterning that fills the backgrounds of so many of these figural textiles was imagery of the Indian clock vine, Thunbergia mysorensis, that dangles in long ropes from verandas and is indigenous to southern India. Elsewhere, I have argued along with many other scholars that we can find resonances between what we know of Golconda's cosmopolitan 17th century life and the people, architecture, and dress, and even the fantastical stories that appear on a small set of figural textiles that have been linked to Muchley Putnam. Through their imagery, the textiles can tell us about questions of ethnicity, skin tone, and gender in the Deccan in this period. The late J.P. Losty has even suggested in the essay, uh, recent essay for Ibakur and Ali Anushar's recent volume on the Mughal Empire, that, quote, Golconda's court art design was transmitted to the painters of the Coromandel textiles in the first half of the 17th century. 
Foste proposes that the figures and flowers traveled as patterns or exemplars from the small scale manuscript paintings to the cotton textiles. It is certainly an exciting and perhaps even likely proposition that manuscript paintings and other courtly arts shaped the creation of Golconda's Kalamkari, and future research could fruitfully explore this hypothesis. But in the concluding section of the talk, I will try to shift from what may have inspired the myriad different designs that we find on the cloth, a question that inevitably pulls in patterns and styles, figures and florals from all over the world, and instead consider how the textiles left their own imprint on the material products and imagined worlds of the 17th century. First, there's the fact that the textiles were in dialogue with one another by reusing and reformulating a repertoire of stylized forms. The small scale figural textiles, likely from Golconda, that measure about two feet by three feet, share repeated human figures, suggesting the use of a template or vocabulary of known motifs. Following Lusty's suggestion, these motifs may also have been copied from extant paintings. But whether their origins lay in the paintings or in the skillful work of cloth painters, once applied to the textiles, the stock figures on the textiles created vignettes that have independent meanings, showing how slight variations in the placement of figures can produce very different relationships. The repeated figures on the cloths include a seated nobleman and his courtesan, a bearded man with a bird on his arm, and a tall man with curling forelocks. In this example that has been repeated across these two uh, textiles, um, the one in the Cincinnati Art Museum and the other in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Now, uh, the artist has intertwined on the left the body of a standing male figure with that of a shorter man. Their robes overlap and bodies press close together, and the taller man caresses his lover's face. On another textile, the taller figure here is repeated, but this time in the guise of a servant. He has the same inclined posture, but now it is in, in order to serve water from a jug he holds in his arms. Variations on a pattern could thus imply romantic relationships or ones of deferential remove. Far from creating monotony, these repetition, re repetitions could change the mood of a textile. A few rare textiles from the early to mid 17th century also suggest that textile painters making cloths for regional patrons and European export may have shared a pattern repertoire. Although this is not the greatest comparison because the colors are so distinctive, perhaps also suggesting different dye materials used. Um, a unique white ground Kalamkari bed cover that was embellished with the Royal Stuart coat of arms can be dated to the reign of either Charles I, 1625 to 49, or Charles II, 1660 to 85. The artists on this work likely copied a muster or pattern to create the central medallion with the coat of arms. However, the majority of this huge textile is painted with a densely packed pattern of animals, including elephants, birds, and Chinese mythological beasts. Between the animals, blooming lotus flowers give way to sprays of other blooms and miniature tree trunks. With its compressed pattern and tapered tips of the floral forms, as well as the frequent use of wax resist details in the red flowers, this textile resembles the iconography and arrangements of motifs found on mid 17th century Kalamkari textiles, likely made for South Asian ports. Um, uh, and and um, John Irwin rightly notes that the coarse nature of the drawing on the example made for the British and the more limited spectrum of colors suggests that the clause would not have been made by the artists of the finest workshops around Muchley Putnam. Yet the shared imagery and style of painting and also compositional arrangement of the textile provides a rare visual suggestion of overlapping artisanship or evidence for an exchange of visual patterns between painters making cloths for European and South Asian consumers in the 17th century, linking together what have historically been studied as separate histories of patronage and production in the region around Muchley Putnam. Far beyond Muchley Putnam, the textiles left a mark on the architectural colors and Kalamkari arts of Iran. Huge quantities of Muchley Putnam cloth traveled to the Safavid Empire, in 60, 1644, nearly 6,000 camels carrying Indian cotton textiles arrived, arrived in Isfahan in a period of eight months. In 1660, the Dutch East India Company unloaded 80,000 pieces of South Asian cloth at the Persian port of Bandar Abbas. In the Safavid capital of Isfahan, the painted walls of the Chahal Sultun could be said to share compositional features with the figural painted cloths of the Coromandel coast. 
more tantalizing is that the deep red backgrounds of the more decorative painted sec sections, which Eleanor Sims attributes to, quote, an imitation of Mughal textiles. Did the cheroot of Muchley Putnam lend its hue to the painted walls of Isfahan? Moreover, the connection to Iran continued. Muchley Putnam, though reported by Europeans to have been depopulated at the end of the 17th century, persisted and indeed persists as a site of textile production that was particularly vibrant in the 19th century due to its export trade to Iran, where the name Muchley Putnam again retained fame. In fact, it is finally in the 19th century on cloths found in Isfahan that we have textiles that can be securely attributed to Muchley Putnam and to its specially skilled artisans. And I'm grateful here to have had the chance to look at these textiles um, at the Royal Ontario Museum at a workshop that uh, Sarah Fee organized um, as part of the cloth that changed the world. So valued were the skills of Muchley Putnam's artists that certain textiles were first hand painted with wax and dyed with indigo in Muchley Putnam, and then likely finished with block printing in Iran. When I first started thinking about these Muchley Putnam cloths, I sought out the myriad ways that they had been shaped by their visual and literary environment. In the talk today, I've reversed this question in the last part of the discussion asking instead how the cloths might have revised their environment, inspired the poetry, and built the spaces of Golconda through which they traveled, so valued and so visibly, visibly recognizable. Among the texts that Sunil Sharma has recently identified as the canon of 17th century Dakini literature at the Qutub Shahi court are Khavasi's Saiful Muluk and Nishati's Pulban, both works of adventure and imagination. The mid 18th century illustrated versions of these works abound with paintings of textiles that resemble extant Kalamkari cloths that we can content tentatively attribute to the areas around Muchley Putnam and Golconda. And it's true that a Kalamkari cloth, now in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, I'm sorry, I'm just showing you a detail of these, um, of these painted textiles, but it's true that a Kalamkari cloth now in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts and likely made in Golconda spins to the music of dancing peris, like those that descend on the court of Saiful Maluk's father in Khavasi's great work of 1617. Khavasi's Saiful Maluk, a narrative or Masnavi poem of 14,000 rhyming verses narrates the maritime quest of an Egyptian prince named Saiful Maluk who has fallen in love with a Chinese princess. While this story has had many different tellings, at the root of Khavasi's version is a cloth. Saiful Maluk first encountered his beloved princess in the form of a portrait found on a textile he received from his father, the king. At the time of writing this work in 1617, Khavasi was a poet at the Qutub Shahi court, and the narrative of the poem recounted both courtly pleasures and the wild adventures in Africa, China, and Istanbul that Saiful Maluk had in his quest to find the Garden of Iram and the princess Badi ul Amal. Although the poem is mythic, and the prince is Egyptian, and the textile is described as embroidered with gold thread, the fact is that the story turns on a textile. Could Khavasi have crafted this presence? Could his audience have believed it if they had not seen and been mesmerized by themselves, by the faces found on the cloths made and around Muchley Putnam? Thank you so much.